this is going to be a very plain talk compared to uh, in terms of the visuals. Let's see if I know how to do this. Oh, the point of this one here. You'll need to. That's on the side. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Where do I go here? Oh, this one. Okay. The, uh, the clicker is counterintuitive. Okay. You pull it towards you, you'll change, you'll go forward right. and push it, push it forward. Uh, anyway, I'm going to have to go over my art block, but, but I haven't done it yet. Uh, so, uh, you know, in, in anyone who's interested in agricultural origins, uh, 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 you know, we really want to know about when, where, what was domesticated, but the frustrating uh, issue is that the traits that are associated with domestication are often hard to or even impossible to discern in the archaeological record. So in the hyssops, or in other words, the keeping of the seed on the stalk, loss of dormancy is almost always cryptic, um, and uh, increase in size of the desired part, although that doesn't necessarily happen uh, right away. And so uh, seed size has been uh, taken uh, because uh, very often, not in all cases, but very often seed size does increase under domestication and so uh, it's being used um, uh, to indicate domestication and, and these are a few examples. Bruce Smith's study of uh, squash in Oaxaca, several species from the Mississippi Valley and uh, I really got interested, uh, my own work is uh, in the Near East, so I got interested when uh, Fuller started talking about some of those crops. Uh, and um, uh, in particular, I had done research uh, for my dissertation on wild meat and on wild barley. And uh, my dissertation was on seed size and, and sort of the ecological factors. And uh, just uh, some of what he was suggesting didn't fit with what I know. So this was a bit of a cautionary. Uh, talk. So there's two basic uh, notions out there about why you might get seed size quite rapidly and under, domestic, under cultivation. Uh, Harlan, Jack Harlan, um, uh, argued that, that cultivation creates a more competitive uh, environment. Uh, I think that might be true for quinopods, uh, 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 things like that, some of the Mississippi Valley species. But, uh, because they're disturbance adapted, typically anyway. But uh, wild wheat and wild barley, they form these dense cereal stands in nature. They have very dense, uh, very competitive conditions. And under cultivation, uh, that wouldn't necessarily be true. Uh, Fuller uh, argued that uh, cultivated, that, that the early uh, cultivators would have been burying their seeds, would have been sticking them in the ground. and. Uh, but therefore they would have needed a larger seed to emerge. Um, uh, and then of course uh, people sometimes intentionally select larger seeds, that's very clear in maize, but not only in maize. Uh, but it's not clear that they would have chosen to do that uh, initially, we don't really know about that. Uh, all right, so Harlan's argument really doesn't make a lot of sense, at least with respect to the wild cereals. Uh, because um, you get soil clearance, you probably have weeding, you probably have space planting, so uh, if anything, it's probably less competition in nature under those circumstances. Uh, as for Fuller's uh, argument, the, the deep planting, that's certainly valid that if you bury seeds, they need, the seeds need to be large to emerge. Uh, but uh, wild emmer in particular is known uh, repeatedly from the early days of, of early discovery of the species uh, repeatedly mentioned how deep it implants its seeds naturally and, uh, and successfully emerges. So, uh, whereas in contrast, uh, I thought their teff, uh, teff is a, it's the Ethiopian grain that uh, has the smallest seed of any domesticated grain and they have to prepare the seed bed very, very carefully in order to get it to, to uh, uh, to establish it. So even though Ethiopians prefer teff, uh, they will often grow wheat or barley because they're so much easier 
to, uh, to establish. Um, at any rate, there's, there's, uh, we also don't really know if farmers were necessarily uh, planting the seeds in the ground or just scattering them on the top. All right, so here's some of the data that um, uh, got me thinking about this. Um, uh, this is from Perugin and, and Fuller, but the, the data are really Fuller's. Uh, and there's some problem here with the legend. Uh, uh, the, the, the left half is about non-shattering, and the right half is what I actually want to talk about is about uh, seed size. Um, but in the legend, they have E, F, and G. So I assume that's the same as D, E, and F, but I'm not, I'm not sure about that. But, uh, but at any rate, um, I mean, these things happen. Uh, but, uh, uh, the one thing you notice, particularly for E and F, is very few data points to be arguing that they And I believe he was using multiple sites as well. So it's, it's, I have to go back and check that. But very few data points to be drawing straight lines or putting up an R squared. Those R squared are probably not significant. Uh, and then, um, like to take D, which is Amorite thing, from the looks of things. Uh, that could just be two different populations. The, the, the one on the left there, uh, when he's, when he's uh, at the zero point, those two data points could just be from one place, and then all the others could be from somewhere else that happen to have larger seeds. Right? So there's, there's, there's um, it, it doesn't take much to, to you can question these pretty, pretty easily. Um, okay, so. There's some contrary evidence already in the literature. Uh, there's not a lot of studies comparing wild uh, wheat and barley with the domesticate, but the studies that have been carried out uh, indicate that uh, although their seeds are a little bit smaller, uh, their seedlings are at least as bigger. And they they're grow just as well under fertile conditions as the domesticates do, uh, possibly because their seeds are higher in protein. Now, uh, the thing here, um, that's a common characteristic in grains that uh, the wild have higher protein levels and the domesticates are higher in, in starch. And so the seed size increase to a large extent is simply an increase in starch, i.e. in calories. Well, it makes sense that people might have wanted that, but there, if there were an adaptive aspect to this. One would think the protein level would have stayed high. So uh, at any rate, uh, they do seem to be highly, uh, again, no one's ever grown them directly against the domesticates to see how they would compete, but, but they seem to be highly competitive. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll just go through uh, some of the uh, uh, genotypic variation here. In, in wild barley, there's a desert uh, wadi race, so-called, that uh, produces small seeds. And then uh, pretty much uh, all the others are large seeds, maybe twice as large. Uh, there's some variation there, of course. Uh, the early sites are all from the desert or desert border, except uh, southeast Turkey. But, uh, and um, so the local populations presumably would have been small seeded. But, <coughs> Yeah, in Southeast Turkey, there probably would have been large seed uh, population. Uh, so, the if, if, right now, the, the current evidence on agriculture in the Near East is that it, most of the species, well, yeah, many to most of the species were domesticated in Southeast Turkey, but barley very likely was not. Uh, and um, it actually domesticated twice, both Southwest and Southeast probably. And so uh, the seed size increase could simply be that in the early state, early sites before agriculture, they were collecting the wild uh, desert wadi rice, but then after uh, wheat cultivation comes into the area, the, the barley as a weed comes along and eventually is domesticated. So um, I'm not saying that's what happened, I'm just saying we have to be aware of alternative <coughs> possibilities. All right, uh, wild demer uh, doesn't have a desert race. It's pretty much restricted to relatively high rainfall. Uh, wide range between populations.
in seed size. Apparently very little within population variation except where there's evidence for introgression from Durham and things like that. Uh, the seed size is clearly correlated with site productivity. Uh, <coughs> so that you have smaller seeds where the sites are relatively unproductive, uh, genotypically smaller, and then uh, larger seeds where their uh, productivity is high. Uh, so again, all you have to do is shift the sites or shift the proportion of sites you're collecting from, and you have the possibility of, of a seed size increase showing up in the record, you know, domestication. All right, I uh, collected, uh, there, there are a lot of various, well, you know, I'm not sure if they're still there actually, but when I was there, this was in the 80s actually, uh, there were a number of small populations of wild ever right in Jerusalem, within the city limits, and um, with highly variable site productivity, in, uh, both between sites and also within sites. Uh, the, these were occurring on limestone, and on limestone you often get uh, enormous variation in soil depth over short distances. So uh, species that are adapted to relatively deep soil, relatively productive soil, they'd be producing seeds that would fall onto shallow soil areas, and then they'd struggle to produce. Um, and the plants would be a lot smaller. In addition, there were all these uh, alterations uh, due to what the uh, Israelis were doing. So, uh, one site that I'm going to show you, there's some uh, there was sewage flowing through the site. So there was little local uh, artificial fertilization. Another site, there was construction on the edge of the site which uh, exposed the underlying rock and so on. Uh, the, uh, what turns out happens is that uh, on any given site, the seed size will increase with the uh, productivity, essentially with the plant height, which you can use as a proxy for that, up to an upper bound, and then it levels off. Uh, and um, seeds can be very small stretches of your... Uh, I once brought a whole collection of the really small seeds from, that have been produced from plants on very shallow microsites. I brought them to uh, Gordon Hillman, uh, who at the time was the archaeobotanist for that part of the world. And he looked at it and he said, oh, that's einkorn, wild einkorn. <laughs> and what is wild ever, which is much larger. Uh, because it's just, uh, mm -hmm. the, the size of it is going to be enormous. All right, so I don't want to bore you with too many of these. But, um, but this is the site that had the artificial uh, fertilizer. And uh, <clears throat> you can see if you draw, if you ask it to, the program, it'll draw a linear relationship there. But, um, you can see there's kind of a gap between uh, plant height 80 and then jumps over to 120 or so. The, the plants on the right there are the ones that uh, were growing where the sewage was flowing through. And so that was the productivity level that population was not really expecting, if you like. So really, if you look at it, what's happening is seed size goes up to about 80 centimeters and then it levels off. Um, so that there's no, there hasn't been time for adaptation to those higher productivity levels. The other thing to notice, it's around about 25 uh, milligrams, something like that. Uh, it's the upper bound there. Okay, so let's go to a more productive site uh, by the Bank of Israel. And there, uh, first of all, you can see the upper bound, if it is an upper bound, is around 30 there. Uh, and in this case, uh, again, there was some Due to construction, there were some very shallow spots where the plants were really stressed. They did manage to produce a few seeds, but very, very small. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm not sure if that's an upper bound there. It was a very small population. I didn't want to gather too many plants. But uh, it does look as though it's basically plateauing at that point. Uh, those also were the really plants were any larger. Uh, all right, so this relates to uh, a concept in ecology known as phenotypic plasticity. And that term uh, can, can be a little bit misleading when we're talking about something like seed weight, because plasticity uh, has the implication of, of being able to be bigger or smaller, basically, or more numerous or less numerous. Uh, and 
Uh, that's valid for any aspect of number, really, when you're talking about class. But uh, when you're talking about mass, there really isn't that ability to increase the size phenotypically above the, whatever that upper bound is. Uh, on the whole, it's a, there is an optimum size that's coded genetically, and then various stresses can reduce that size out there in nature. And particularly in annuals, and of course, uh, most of these plants we're talking about were uh, wild progenitors were, were annuals. Uh, the same pattern was demonstrated a long time ago by, uh, in the agronomic literature, uh, and of increasing seed size up to a particular upper bound, and then after that, it's just flat. And so this is well known in domesticates, and for that reason, I don't really feel like I have to, I have lots more of these graphs from other populations that all show this. And then I grew them in uniform gardens, and there's no correlation between the seed weight going in and the seed weight going out, because within a given population, the variation is almost all phenotypic rather than genetic. So, um, what this means is in nature, the seed weight, the mean seed weight is always, almost always going to be less than what the plant is actually trying to produce optimally. Under cultivation, presumably, you're going to get the seed weight increase then phenotypically uh, almost immediately because cultivation probably will give you better uh, growing conditions. Uh, <clears throat> so it could be that. Uh, also, as I said, because there is genetic variation between populations, between sites, it also could depend on just where the seeds are coming from, and what's being collected. So, um, uh, oh, and then the, the, there's also some non-adaptive uh, changes that I, I should mention here. Uh, at least in wild emmer, uh, and also wild anchor, actually, the looms uh, constrain the seed. They really, the seed is tightly constrained within the within the glooms, and that um, actually determines how big the seed can get. And under domestication, the glooms are no longer really needed, and tend to, um, tend to uh, distribution tend to fall away, unless you get naked grains, so-called, where you don't really have the glooms anymore, at least not at, at maturity. And that actually allows the seed to expand in the third dimension, so that you get automatically a seed size increase without any real uh, adaptive uh, aspect to that. Uh, however, that also then allows there to be more florets, more fertile florets, which then can in turn decrease the seed size. And so you actually get a fairly complex pattern in the domesticated weeds where some of them are very large, some of them are not really much larger than, uh, than the wild, than at least some of the larger forms of the wild. All right, so uh, I don't want to dismiss Harlan's uh, uh, hypothesis entirely because no one's ever really tested it. I'm just saying it doesn't sound to me like it makes a lot of sense, but there needs to be uh, testing of that. Uh, Fuller's argument is certainly valid if the people were planting the stuff, but again, not for wild wheat, I don't think, or probably for wild barley, because those seeds are big and they can emerge from six inches or more than a problem. Uh, the big issue here is that phenotypic variance is so great and underappreciated, and so to, uh, and I don't know exactly what we do to go forward to really try to <laughs> parse this out, but we do need to, uh, to to look, to do more experimental work, it seems to me, to see what, um, how we can parse out phenotypic variants from genetic in terms of using that as a trait uh, to, to, to tell us that we have a domestic here. And again, uh, wild wheat and wild barley are different from a lot of the other species in being large seeded to start with and able to emerge from death. So I'm not saying that this would be true uh, of you know, there's so many other species, like particularly the Mississippi Valley ones, uh, which I don't really know very well anyway, but I'm not. That's probably a different story. Okay? So that's it. Thanks. We have time for a couple of questions. Yeah, there's um, 
some indication in terms of yield around cereal grains, and it's not the size of the seed, but rather the number of seeds uh, per, you know, spike or, or so, cop, and the length of the grain filling period. And so, looking at productivity in terms of the weight of the seed, I mean, it's possible that when people were selecting, they actually did select not for the weight of the seed, but for the number of seeds per. Uh, yeah, that's very good, actually. The, uh, there's a general principle that the size of the desired part increases, like in cabbage, you get, you get right? But, um, the, uh, so in the case of a seed crop, it's the inflorescence right. that gets larger, and typically also can coalesce it so that it's not on a lot of little scattered, uh, like a sunflower or a wild sunflower. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's, and then the length of the grain filling, that makes sense, and in the Middle East, the problem is that the summer drought comes right. up, so you can't really, yeah. you can't really expand it. Right. Once you well, move it, it out of there, you can. It, it seems to me that, that people that were first planting these, they wouldn't have probably taken notice of the length of the grain filling period, but certainly the number of seeds per inflorescence would have been quite obvious. Yeah. And I mean, but it also seems that intuitively you'd want to take something that has larger seeds, but you know, perhaps they realized it wasn't the size of the seed but the number of seeds for inflorescence yeah. that indicated that the more yeah, it, 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 it does make sense that they might be just grabbing somewhat larger seeds even if they weren't really thinking about yeah. it. But, but, yeah. We had a question back there. Well, I'm just wondering about, and you looked at the heritability of that, you would be the difference the large and small seed size, you could determine whether it's actually, that is heritable. Okay, so, when you grow these in uniform gardens, I said there was no, I meant within population, there's no correlation, but the, the ones that are from the less productive sites do produce smaller seeds than the ones from the more productive sites. So there's definitely genetic between population variation. That, now, I haven't actually tried to quantify that, but it's also been well studied well, particularly by the Israeli geneticists, uh, that there's, there's a huge range from the largest seed, the largest seed one of all are uh, just north of the Sea of Galilee. They're extremely productive. Uh, you know, it used to be the bread basket. <laughs> uh, it's where the, the loaves and fishes, are, the, you know, that. Um, so, uh, so it is well, well understood that there is genetic variation. It tends to be between populations. Yeah. One brief question. Well, yeah, very brief. Wondering how emerald berries that seed six inches deep. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, I, if I'd been thinking, I would have brought some uh, or one anyway. They're um, they're very aerodynamically shaped, and as they come off with with backward pointing barbs, so they only go in one direction. It's a whole aero aero type shape, so it drops. Doesn't really disperse onto an animal or anything that drops and then crawls along the ground until it hits a crack and then goes into the crack. I mean, the descriptions of this, I've seen it, but also it's all over the literature going way back. That's what it is. Thank you.